Lord and a very warm welcome to everyone who have joined Father's Care online service. We are so excited this morning to join you from our new premises. God is good all the time. Bible says, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. So before you join us in praise and worship, let us say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. God bless you all. And as I invite Father's Care Worship Team to lead us into praise and worship. I want you to join us in worship as we lift up our worship unto our Maker. Let us do it with an open heart and tell Him how much we adore Him. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Let's worship. Me chao, me chao, 
you, Jesus. Come on, let's cry out unto you. Let's give him praise, give him glory, give him adoration. We cry out unto you. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Lord, we worship you, Lord. Daddy mercy, we sing. that your presence is mighty in this place. That, that same presence will touch the people watching. Lord, be with every viewer watching right now. Fall fresh upon them. Heal them, set them free, dear Jesus. Whatever uh, tribulation or turmoil, whatever season they're going through, Lord, let your peace that surpasses all understanding guard their heart and mind. Lord, renew them. Renew their strength like the wings of eagles, Lord. For your thoughts towards us of peace and not of evil, to give us a future and a hope. And Lord, we rely in you. We trust in you. And above all, we love you, dear Jesus. Lord, I just pray that you be with your servant as they bring word, Lord. That it falls on good ground, dear Jesus. That it manifests into flesh, Lord. 
that it's something we can use, something that we need to carry on. I just trust that your word goes to the right place. Lord, we just trust in what you're doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. And we give you thanks and we give you glory. And above all, we love you, we love you, we love you. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, and everybody said, amen, amen. So let's get into it. Let's get ready for the word. Get your Bibles ready and your notepads ready. It's time to get into the word and give God glory. Amen. Good morning, church, and praise the Lord. Thank you so much for tuning in to our service. And once again, a very warm welcome to each one of you. What a joy and what a delight to bring this service to you and the Word of God from our new premises. This is the Lord's doing and it is marvellous in our eyes. God said that 2020 is our year of new wine and behold, He is making all things new. Hallelujah. So let's get right into the Word. You know, to this morning, I want to encourage you from the book of Jonah. God has been really speaking to me through some Old Testament characters and prophets. And I believe His intention is to show his heart, his character, that how consistent he is in his love for people. And the Bible tells us that God's heart is for none to perish, but all come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So have you ever battled thoughts where you have probably thought that, you know, a particular group of people or place or persons in your life who have probably caused you hurt or pain, don't deserve God's mercy or His grace. You know, this message is for you. This message will encourage you and reveal the Father's heart. So come right with me to the book of Jonah and we are going to see chapter 4 verses 1 to 4. Let's read. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore, I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Then the Lord said, Is it right for you? to be angry? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus and through your precious blood, we are in your presence this morning, Lord. As the word comes before your precious people, let it indeed be my mouth, but your words. Let your anointing flow in this place, uncompromised, unhindered. Let minds be renewed, lives be transformed, the body of Christ edified, and the name of Jesus glorified. All the honour, praises and glory is yours. Holy Spirit, have your way. In Jesus' name, we pray and ask. And everybody said, Amen. Hallelujah. This morning, I'll be speaking on, love is calling us to Nineveh. If you're watching this with somebody, tell them, say, love is calling us to Nineveh. Yes. I want to read the message translation of Jonah chapter 4 verses 1 to 4. It says, Jonah was furious. He lost his temper. He yelled at God. I don't know if you do that sometimes, but Jonah did. God, I knew it. When I was going back home, I beg your pardon, when I was back home, I knew this was going to happen. That's why I ran off to Tarshish. I knew you were sheer grace and mercy, not easily angered, rich in love, and ready at the drop of a hat to turn your plans of punishment into a program of forgiveness. So God, if you won't kill them, kill me, for I'm better off dead. God said, what do you have to be angry about? <laughs> for you to appreciate what I've just read, let me just give you a brief background on the book of Jonah. Jonah has really four chapters, but again, it is packed 
with revelation. Jonah is a Jewish prophet and God commissions him or instructs him to go to the city of Nineveh. You know, God wants Jonah to go and preach the good news that they may turn to God. But Nineveh is a pagan Assyrian city and is a long-standing enemy of Israel. And so Jonah has a lot of, you know, patriotic and nationalistic feelings within him that is very much against this group of people. And so in rebellion to God's instruction, he goes in the opposite direction, trying to escape the presence of God. And, but we all know we can't escape the presence of God. But the spirit of prophecy follows Jonah all the way to Tarshish, on his way to Tarshish. Long story short, you know, the boat that he's in, the ship, God causes a storm to come and the sailors throw him overboard. God makes sure there's a big fish there who swallows Jonah up. And Jonah is in the belly of this big fish for three days and three nights until Jonah cries out. And the Bible says that God speaks to this big fish and he spits Jonah out. And Jonah reluctantly has to obey or he reluctantly obeys the second instruction that comes to Jonah and says, Jonah, I rise, go to Nineveh and preach the message that I've given you. And so Jonah does and to his dismay, note what I said, to his disappointment, the whole city of Nineveh, and mind you, there are more than 120,000 souls in that city, from the common people to the king, from the least to the greatest, all of them repent after hearing the message Jonah had for them from God, and they all turn to God. And you know what? Jonah goes uphill wanting to watch over the city in case, you know, it wasn't a genuine thing just to watch over them and see what happens next. And he's really disappointed that the whole city is actually turned to God. And that's why Jonah 4 and verse 2, he's yelling and he's screaming at God and says, you know, God, I knew it. I knew you were going to relent and not punish these people. That's why I didn't want to come here in the first place. And so he's still angry and he's sitting up there. He builds a little shelter for himself. And then God in his mercy, you know, he makes a plant grow that the plant can give Jonah a shade over his head. But in the, and Jonah is so grateful and happy. And the next day, God makes a worm to eat that plant. And the sun is out and the storm, the, uh, the wind is strong. And now Jonah is angry and upset that this plant is gone. And so God is saying to Jonah, Jonah, you are so concerned about this plant, but what about that more than 120,000 people in the city? The souls that my heart longs for. How come you are angry? And so this is the story. This is the background. We don't know how Jonah responds to God's question or correction, but all we know that Jonah was very adamant in his heart and mind that this particular group of people were not deserving of God's mercy. Well, this morning I'm talking to the church, to the body of Christ, that how many times we have allowed our own worldviews or prejudice or discrimination or values or thinking, how many times we have allowed these things to come and stop or hinder what God wants to do in and through our lives? How many times we have become those vessels that has been a hindrance to the flow of God's mercy, grace and love to the people like in Nineveh. But this morning, I want to remind you, church, that this message is a reminder, a calling, a stirring, an encouragement that love is calling us to Nineveh. What is your Nineveh this morning? 
It could be a group of people that you never like. It could be a group of people that has hurt you. It could be a city. It could be a nation that you don't really care about. It could be, you know, people marginalized by their doctrines or thinking and you have not much of a, a affection or mercy or grace or kindness or love to shower upon them. And that has caused you to, you know, stop caring about them. Or better still, maybe God is actually prompting you in this season and asking asking you to go to a particular group and to a city or nation or people that you never really cared about or don't think that they deserve God's mercy. But in this season, you know why? Because this season has truly, truly, we have embarked on a new era. And in this new era, God is about to raise people, you know, foolish and weak people for His glory and to places that we never imagined, to cities, to nations, to groups who have not heard the good news of Jesus Christ. And God is asking His church, His body to rise up and go to those places like He told Jonah. But we can't afford to have the heart and the attitude of Jonah church. Our heart needs to be in sync, in harmony with the heartbeat of God. And as you do, every heartbeat, every step will tell you that God is for people and not against them. So this message is coming your way to expose and reveal the Father's heart for people. You know, it is time that we put our doctrines aside the Bible says in Titus 3 and verse 9, but avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions and strivings about the law for they are unprofitable and useless. Instead of, you know, debating about useless things, souls are at risk, church. Souls are downtrodden, hurting, backsliding. We've got to win the loss. We've got to reconcile them to the Father. You see, Jonah had the knowledge of God's love because he says so in Jonah 4 and verse 2. So Jonah had a head knowledge of the love of God. But what a pity that head knowledge didn't drop to his heart. Otherwise, Jonah would not have rebelled against the commandment of God because Jonah's heart would have been in harmony with God's heart. For too long, so many things we just know about God as a head knowledge. It is time for the church of Jesus Christ to truly get a revelation of the Father's heart for people. And this morning, I pray that you will open your heart and mind to listen to what the Spirit of God is saying to His bride to His church, to His body for the sake of those souls. It is time that we will say like Job in 42 verse 5, He said, I've heard you with the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. In other words, Job had so much knowledge about God from other people, but because of his experiential journey with God, he got to know who God was for himself. And this is the season the church has to come into a personal, intimate relationship with God because it is going to be dangerous otherwise to go out there and represent the Father's heart without truly knowing Him personally for ourselves. And so the first point I want to share with you this morning is that God made all people. Come on, shout somebody and say, God made all people. Yep, I can hear you. The Bible says in Colossians 1 and verse 16, For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible, invisible, thrones, dominions, principalities or powers. All things were created through Him and for Him. John chapter 1 verse 3 says, All things were made through Him and without Him nothing was made that was made, church. So every 
person in that city of Nineveh, more than 120,000 people, they were existing by the will and by the permission of God, like the 7.5 billion people are existing in our current world. Because the Bible says the Spirit of God has made us and the breath of the Almighty gives us life according to Job 33 and verse 4. In fact, let me tell you what Job 34 verses 14 and 15 says. This is, this is mind-blowing. It says, if he should, God, should set his heart on it and if he should gather to himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh would perish altogether and man would return to dust. In other words, every mankind is existing only because of the will and the permission of God. That means no soul on planet earth is a mistake or an accident, regardless of what you think or I think or how we feel or what they have maybe indirectly or directly done to us, the Bible says that all of them have been created by Him and for Him. So God made all people. Jeremiah 1 and verse 5 says that before I formed you, I knew you. Before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. So I always say, God knows the good, the bad, the ugly about us. And so I want you to know that God made all people, including those in that city of Nineveh and in our world today. Number two, God loves all people. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son and He promised that those who believe in Him will not perish but have an everlasting life. How, do, how can you say, Pastor Rekha, that God loves everybody? You know why? Because God's kind of love gives. It is the agape love, the unconditional love, the love that is benevolent, the love that is always thinking about the highest good of another person. And the Bible says in Romans 5 and verse 8, but God demonstrates His love that even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is not some, you know, wishy-washy, romantic kind of love I'm talking about. I'm talking about the agape love of God. And this love is for all people, including those people in the city of Nineveh, the people that Jonah didn't want to go to. There's a group of people, perhaps God wants to go and lavish His love. Because the Bible says in 1 John 4 verses 8 to 10, hear this out. He who does not love God does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us that God sent His only begotten Son into the world. In this world, there is 7.5 billion people. And so this gift of His love is for every one of them. Hallelujah that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. You know, the reason why we can love God is because the Bible says in 1 John 4, 19, that He first loved us. And God today, is reminding His church that as we first were recipient of His love, now as His body, as His church, can we be the first ones to break barriers and go and love people? The unlovable, who according to your mind and heart do not deserve God's mercy. But my question this morning is, what makes us say that we were deserving of His mercy, of His love? That's right. You know I'm telling the truth that many a times we have been unlovable, but yet God in His mercy, in His grace matters where we are. And today we know Him as our Lord, as our Saviour and as our Redeemer, our King. 
And God wants the same love to reach to the ends of the earth. God loves all people and love is calling us to our Nineveh. If you read the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 to 8, often this scripture is quoted, you know, at occasions, especially like marriages and weddings. And we want to glorify what love is. We want to advise and counsel the newlywed what love is. But let me tell you, if you truly want to understand love, this is what it says. It says, love suffers long. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely. Love does not seek its own. Love is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and doers all things because God's kind of love never fails. Hallelujah. And we see that when God through Jonah reaches the city of Nineveh, more than 120,000 people turn to God. You know why? Because God loved them as well. Yes, there are people in your life that you perhaps don't care much about or has caused you hurt and harm. The way God loves you, God also loves them. And when you get a revelation of the Father's heart for people, this is the kind of love I'm talking about. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 to 8. It is not a love that seeks our own benefit, thinks about our own feelings. It is not about how we feel. It is about the Father's heart for the people. And the Bible is clear that God loves all people. Point number three. God's redemptive plan includes all people. That's right. God's plan of salvation includes all people, all background, nationality, city, nation, whatever, wherever you're from, whatever you, whoever you are, God included you in His plan of salvation because Jesus has been given to all of humanity. You see, the Bible says, in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God, of eternal life in Christ Jesus is for all. So Jesus has been given to all. The Bible tells us in 2 Peter 3.9, For God doesn't want any to perish, but all come to repentance. His heart is according to 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 to 6. And let's get this right. So we don't behave like Jonah. We don't decide who deserves God's mercy and who doesn't. Because as far as the Father is concerned, His desire is none shall perish, but all come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And somebody shout, Hallelujah. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 to 6. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Saviour, who desires all men to be saved. Somebody shout, all. The Bible says, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. Again, say, all to be testified in due time. You know, one day I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, like, what's your heart? You know, when people don't know you or they, they have not accepted the gospel, now how does your heart respond? And He took me to the book of Ezekiel 33 and verse 11. And I really want to read this to you. It says, say to them as I leave, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn away from his way and leave. Turn, turn from your evil ways. For why should you die, O house of Israel? That's the heart of the Father. He doesn't delight in the death of the wicked. 
from the Old Testament to the New. It is so consistent. The Father's heart is so consistent. Every time He brings a message or sends His voice or His prophet and in New Testament time, we as witnesses of Jesus Christ, He only wants people to repent. In other words, change their thinking, change their mind, change from their lifestyle and be reconciled to Father God through Christ Jesus. That's His heart. You know, Jonah represents like a New Testament Pharisee. You know, those Pharisees and Sadducees in the New Testament who are so self-righteous, who knew everything about the law, yet they were hindering the message of the kingdom, the message of repentance to come to people. And that's why God said, uh, Jesus said, that you know, you by you, by your tradition, you are making the Word of God come no effect. That's why He said in Matthew 9 and verse 17, that we cannot put the new wine into the old wineskin. Church, we need to repent. We need to change our mind. There's some things that we as a body of Christ need to work on. Because there is a group of people God is asking you to go. Like God asked Jonah to go to Nineveh, to a place where he was not happy to go to because he disliked them as they were long-standing enemies of Israel. But this morning, God even has a plan of redemption for your enemy. Hallelujah. You know why? Because God created him or her. We didn't, God did. And so it hurts the Father's God, Father God's heart to see them perish. Like any parent's heart is hurting when they see their children backsliding, suffering and lost. Well, that is the heart of the Father. That He's asking His children to go to the lost, go to the backslidden and reconcile them to me. And that brings me to the final point that God's commission is to all His members of the church, to His body, to all believers. The great commission of Matthew 28 verses 19 to 20 says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the age. The command was given, go therefore to all the nations. And in all the nations, we will find all sorts of people. Once we got saved church, the Bible says according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 to 20, God has given us a ministry of reconciliation. We cannot say that I have nothing to do. You all, all believers, all the members of His body, His church, we have a ministry and that ministry is called the ministry of reconciliation. Hallelujah. The Bible says now all things are of God who has reconciled us to Himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Verse 20, Now then we as ambassadors for Christ, as though God was pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. We don't have a ministry of strive, a ministry to separate people, a ministry of, you know, uh, division or subtraction. We have a ministry, the Spirit that has reconciled of us to Father. He's inside of us and He's the one who's wanting to reconcile the loss, reconcile the backslidden back to Father God. Church, we have a commission. We have work to do and in this new era, we cannot be like Jonah and hold on to our discrimination, hold on to our prejudice and worldviews 
and values and ideologies and doctrines and theologies and arguments. None of that is going to win the souls. I remember God saying to me once that Rekha, you'd rather lose an argument and win a soul. And I think it's time to do that. That God's heart is to see people reconcile to himself through his son, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. You know, the Bible says to the believers that we are to live by faith and not by sight. And of course, the world trusts their carnal senses. But you know what? The Bible says that we are the light of the world. Let them see the light of Christ through you. The Bible says that we are the salt of the earth. Let them taste the goodness of God through you. The Bible says that wherever we go, we are to diffuse the fragrance of Christ. Let them smell the glory of God. The Bible says that we have the kingdom of God within us. And so wherever we go, let them experience the presence, the warmth and the love of God. Let them feel the presence and the love of God. Wherever we go, the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. And so let us speak and release words of faith wherever we go. Church, it is time to become not just in theory, but in practicality. Become His body. Become the eyes, the ears, the mouth, the, the legs, the hands, the body of Christ. And let us move and go where He's calling us to go. Love is calling us to Nineveh. Love is calling us to the place that we didn't want to go. You know, maybe you've got some mindsets against certain group of people. But this morning, the Spirit of God is convicting you and touching you. And beloved, let me make one thing clear. You know, often we have allowed our carnality and our misconceptions to obstruct the flow of the Spirit. You see, all we need to do is turn up, turn up at every commandment, every instruction. We are to turn up and deliver the message. It is the Spirit of God, according to John 16 and verse 8. It is the Spirit of God that is going to convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. You see, we often want to take the place of the Holy Spirit, but we are not to do the work of the Spirit of God. We are just the delivery people. We are the messengers. We are His body. And as we deliver His message to Nineveh, to the people that God is sending you to, oh beloved, the Bible says, not by might, not by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. I will touch their heart, I will convict them, and I will turn them to me. Hallelujah. And so this morning, as I conclude my message, I pray that you will leave aside that spirit of Jonah, that spirit of legalism, that spirit of religion, that spirit of set mind. Who are we to decide who deserves God's mercy or not? God made all people. God loves all people. God's redemptive plan is for all people. And the ministry of reconciliation, remember, is to all the members of His body, His church. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus and through Your precious blood, Lord, as Your Word has come before Your precious people, I pray, Father God, that let it be a reminder. And I thank You, Lord, that today is a day of deliverance, Lord, that many strongholds in our mind has been broken that our hearts will be open. 
and we will obey immediately to the peoples, to the groups, to the cities, to the nations that you are sending us to. If Jesus could stop for that Samaritan woman at the village of Samaria, it's because her life mattered to God and she was included in the plan of salvation. And because Jesus stopped that day, the Bible says the whole city of Samaria heard the gospel. So I pray, beloved, as you say yes to God and no to your judgmental, criticism, condemning ways, that through your life, like the city of Nineveh was saved, you will have testimonies that there are lives, thousands of lives who's going to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ just because you said, yes, Lord, send me. I will go to Nineveh because the love of God is calling us to Nineveh. Father, be with your people. Strengthen us this hour. Help us, Holy Spirit, that our heart is in harmony with yours. We love you, Abba. Thank you. Protect your people, Lord. I cover each one under your blood. And in Jesus' mighty name, we pray and ask. And everybody said, Amen, Amen, Amen. Hallelujah. To God be the glory. Love is calling you to Nineveh. Stay blessed. I surrender all to you. Everything I need to you. I surrender. Everything I give to you Withholding nothing Withholding nothing I give myself away Give myself away So you can use me Give myself away pastor for that wonderful message. I truly hope that it's been a blessing to you. I hope that it's been a word in season. And before we let you go, we'd just like to go through the declaration. 2020 is my year of new wine. I am living a surrendered life to God-given vision, wisdom and purpose. I am His vessel. 
a new wineskin to receive, conceive and give birth to the new He wants to do in and through me. He is enlarging my capacity to receive all that He has in store for me. Jesus, pour this new wine out of me that will draw souls from the four corners of this earth into your kingdom. Teach me to number my days that I may gain a heart of wisdom. Help me to live, love and serve like you, Jesus, that it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. My body is your temple of the Holy Spirit. Not my will, but yours be done. Thank you, Lord, that you have crowned 2020 with your goodness and your path for me is dripping with an overflow of your abundance. 2020 marks a new era, a new dimension propelling me to the fulfillment of my destiny. This is my year. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you once again for joining us. We truly hope that you've been blessed. Don't forget to like, subscribe and share our videos available on YouTube and on Facebook. God bless.